Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction. Yes, uh, my name is Jamie Graves. I'm the chief exec of Zoomfox. Uh, we've been around for about four years. Uh, we use big data analytics and other cool sounding things to, to help track data usage within the organisation. Um, but over the past four years, we've also built up a lot of other, other expertise as well uh, in terms of understanding why people take stuff from organisations and some of the, the motivations. And really, the, the reason for today's presentation is to show you some of our experiences. So there's a case study uh, that I'm going to talk you through this evening with a recent client of ours uh, who will uh, remain yeah. nameless for various reasons. And also some of the, the latest thinking from the, the Insider Threat Research community as well. And that community is made up of the FBI uh, and also the CERT in the US as well. And there's uh, some fantastic resources that I urge you to go and have a look at at the end of the presentation if, you find, if, you're, if you're intrigued by it. So the slide up there, no one's going to get slides, um, so this slide deck, if you don't want to take notes, don't worry about it. Um, I'll make it available for you if you want to have a look at it. Um, so I'm going to start today with uh, this gentleman here, uh, Robert Hansen. Um, does anyone know who Robert Hansen is, or heard of his exploits, or know why I'm about to talk about him? Well, for much of his career, Robert Hansen was a... The FBI, and then he was a Good man, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So over a 22-year period, Robert Hansen was paid about $1.8 million to basically steal and give information to Soviets. And then once, uh, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was at the Russian intelligence services. Uh, and Robert Hansen is currently doing uh, multiple life sentences in, in a super high maximum security prison in the US because of these crimes. And Robert Hansen basically provides us with some, some interesting insights into some of the things we're going to talk about, some of the characteristics of individuals, why they may be motivated to steal information from an organization. Um, but beyond the spies and James Bond kind of malarkey, it's very interesting. Uh, data theft has a real impact on businesses. Uh, and the case study we'll talk you through uh, could have been potentially incredibly expensive for the organization we we're, were working with. And some of these statistics come from the CERT uh, IP theft um, white paper. Um, I cite it at the end of the presentation if you want to have a look at it yourself. Uh, some organizations lose a million dollars worth of sales revenue through just losing files information. Could be sales lists, customer lists. Uh, one particular organization, $100 million in estimated damages. I know for a fact that the McLaren uh, racing team in 2007 will find $100 million for allegedly uh, stealing information about car designs from Ferrari. That's a huge worry. This is a slightly different organization. But it's that sort of leakage of information that can be highly um, uh, costful for an organization. Documents with $40 million lost. Uh, this one was a pharmaceutical company. Half a billion dollars worth of research knocked out the door. Um, in all cases, we've got competitive advantage, lost. And in some cases, the businesses will be bankrupt because they, they lose their ideas, they lose their, their crown jewels. So it has real impacts. But the issue is, is that data is ephemeral. It's, uh, it's hard to associate with value. So it's a really tricky subject to bring up and understand what's walking out the door, what's, what's truly important to an organization. And that's where sometimes a lot of the issues lie. <coughs> so what we're gonna do today is gonna have a quick look at what the insider threat is, what we define it as in terms of malicious behavior. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the psychological factors. Uh, because I'm a techie person, I love technology, I'm not going to go down that path because you can go down that path and get deeply lost. Sometimes you've got to take a step back, understand what the motivation, the triggers are. It gives you a far better context to collect data and make better informed decisions. Uh, we're going to look at behaviours. Uh, we are going to look at a case study uh, based on some experiences we had um, uh, earlier on this year. And we'll look at some of the lessons learned. These are evolving lessons and some of the things that you could maybe apply to, to your experiences and practice. So who here is in information security domain? Who is studying it? Who would like to be like to go into it? Okay, excellent. Cool. So so hopefully this will help help inform some of your decisions about how you start picking up evidence around these particular pieces. So what is the insider threat? <coughs> this evening I'm not going to talk about the accidental data breach that happens all the time because that's an entirely different presentation. 
and it happens constantly, and it's really annoying, but it happens to all of us. And most of the clients we go to see, that's the main thing that they're worried about. They're worried about stuff that's not encrypted, goes on a laptop or a USB stick, walks out the door, walks out the door and suddenly they've lost their client list. It happens all the time. And that's a completely different context, there's lots of things you can do around that, but it's really frustrating for them. So we're going to talk about <coughs> the malicious inside of the person who is working in your organization and wants to nick something from you for personal gain or profit. So why do they do it? So it's a current former employee or contractor, interestingly enough. Uh, some of the companies we've worked with have had issues with contractors gaining access to large stories of their network, taking juicy bits of information and walking out the door. Um, so typically we're looking at theft for financial gain. So this could be skimming money from tills uh, when it comes to retail uh, insider theft. Could be stealing documents to sell it to competitors to start up your company organization. IT sabotage, that's an interesting one. That's typically former employees or employees who are about to be given the boot. So IT admins, for example, um, blocking out systems, threatening to turn off important servers, so on and so forth. Uh, and then you start to get into the kind of James, James Bond stuff down here. Um, the reason why I mentioned Robert Hansen is because he and the case study are two opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of espionage and MI6 and all that kind of good stuff. But they have common strands between them in terms of the motivation of the actors. So it doesn't have to be very uh, sophisticated or glamorous, I guess you could call it that, uh, for it to, to affect your organisation for there to be similar aspects to each of these particular incidents. Um, before I go any further, I just want to give a, a bit of an insight into what's at risk, what is IP, what does it look like? Because um, I'm going to use this term IP, but it's going to be business documents, it's going to be a whole range of stuff on your organization's networks. So typically it's trade secrets. Typically a lot of organizations, they don't want to paint it stuff precisely because, well, once it's painted, it's out in the open, people can copy it. So trade secrets are one of the biggest things that, that go missing. Highly competitive, uh, gives someone a lot of advantage. Organisational information is the next down. So this could be about how uh, amazingly well structured your business is. It could be the competitive advantage. It could be the processes that you've implemented to give you your USP or your edge in the market. Source code is a good one. Uh, typically, that's stolen uh, by emailing it out or USB drives. I've got a section later on on how stuff is stolen. Typically, people don't print source code code out because you can spot someone walking out the door with one of these, very easy to spot them. Proprietary software, so that software potentially developed in-house to again give you business advantage, maybe give you process advantage. Customer information, customer lists, uh, there's an asset management firm in Edinburgh right now who are currently suing a firm based in England for stealing their customer list. But they didn't really steal it, an employee picked it up, walked out the door with it, went to another organisation, start the business there, Bob's your uncle, great stuff. So they're really miffed about that. So it's these sorts of things that people are trying to protect against. And sometimes businesses are worth so much that business plans are their USP. It's not our business. We've got a great business, but our business plan isn't that revolutionary. But some of them are. So it's about protecting that particular piece of technical advantage. So we've got all this important stuff in your organization. You need to keep it safe. And you know, in 2014 we've got lots of security tools and lots of security products, so what is the issue here? And the issue is, well, it's kind of, it's complexity, it's really difficult to secure organisations at a certain point in their life cycle. A lot of people I speak to say, I want to implement these security policies, but people tell me to turn them off. And I don't, and, and they get away and they can't do the job, it's really tricky to implement the controls we need. And a lot of organisations have invested a lot in controls that are maybe only 50% turned on, 75%, and are not giving complete coverage. Um, it's easy for insiders to establish um, ways out of the organisation for the data. So shadow IT, for example, is a term that is trending uh, in terms of a threat to an organisation. So things like Dropbox, Google Drive, I mean, you installing an FTP server, being able to serve it to the outside world, or even setting up uh, an instance in AWS and a server on being on that and uploading data to it. It's really difficult to lock these things down. And so you've got this balance between locking down your entire environment 
and having a bunch of employees who are really upset and you constantly for not being able to do their job. So this is really interesting and difficult balance within an organization. And also, finally, encryption. Encryption is great, but it's also hard to implement across the organization as well. Um, and typically doesn't help when information is in use. So what's the answer? Well, the technology is the answer. Uh, it can be part of the answer. Um, and this is where we're getting into the non-techy part of the presentation. And this is where I want you to think about context and the reason why these next few slides are, are put up on screen. We can get all the answers from all the systems that we deploy. We can put in a network intrusion detection system, we can scan emails, we can look through file systems, we can get it all. But you're going to spend the rest of your life looking through this massive haystack, looking for one needle, unless you can get some context around why someone's taking something from your organization. So if you can think of it in terms of, um, Rushnaya says that security is a process. It's the same with this particular piece here as well. You can link the reasons for the <coughs> to different processes you may have in your organization. You've got a slightly better chance of understanding why someone stole something. Uh, I like this picture. It's a Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, it describes a lot of systems that I see, but it's cool anyway. So, psychological factors. These are some of the interesting aspects of why people steal stuff. So let's go back to Robert Hansen. Robert Hansen is a very successful career FBI man. He was born into the service. He was, um, he was smart and he knew it. Um, he had lots of good ideas. And again, he knew it. He liked to give his good ideas out. And you sometimes wonder, well, he's got a good career. He's, he lives in New York. He's got a family. He's got a wife. Why would someone like this do something like this? And the immediate answer, I guess, is money. You think, well, two million dollars seems all right. That's over a 22 year period. It's not that much. Two million dollars to betray your, your organization, your country, and potentially, and he was put into prison for the rest of his life, for two million dollars. I don't know. I, I, it doesn't sit right with me. He did lead a fairly expensive lifestyle. Um, he lived in New York City at the time, which uh, apparently was very expensive. He had a couple of kids. He and his wife liked to be out, socialize, so he had a fairly expensive lifestyle. So I think the money helped in terms of what he was trying to achieve. However, if we, if we pick a little further into Robert inside the FBI, we start to understand maybe a few more reasons why he started stealing information from them. Robert was a smart guy. He had a huge ego. He really loved his ideas. But he kept on being passed over for promotion. And each time he was passed over for promotion, resentment grew within him. And I, th I think, I personally think, that the reason why he did it was because he could show he was better than the FBI. He could show, I will take this information and I will give it to your competitors, your enemies, and you won't be able to catch me. Because at the same time he, his resentment was growing, he has been groomed by the Soviets. They were the Soviets at the time. The Soviet intelligence services were saying, you're better than this, Robert. I can't believe you work in this organization. Why, why don't you leave? But before you leave, make sure you copy all this data for us. And make sure you leave for us at this, 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 uh, this drop point. And Robert's thinking, yeah, yeah, I can do this. You know, this is, this is the way it should be. I really want to put one over the FBI. So I think that's one of his motivations. So when it comes to other motivations, there, there's other research in this area. Um, so revenge is one particularly motivating factor. Um, so for, for, for Robert Hansen, his ego, potentially monetary problems, probably was offset by that. Alienation in the organization, and he was being groomed by an external party. Uh, so when we have a look at the others for things like um, ideology, uh, identification with a, an external party, adventure thrill, it's kind of exciting being a spy. I get to attend on James Bond, that's fantastic. Um, vulnerability to blackmail, so what's going on in the pers person's personal life, are they being blackmailed, stealing information, uh, potentially addictive compulsory behaviour as well, uh, and gambling problems can also lead to issues internally. So already we start to see some issues that may need to be addressed through things other than IT security, so HR processes, processes that you may want to implement in-house to help support an individual or help spot these things if they come up. Now, um, th there are some things, some 
some of these particular motivators and behaviours as well. There's still the research, there's still a bit of contention about some of them, but the point remains in terms of making sure that the process is there, that it can be spotted from not just an IT security perspective, but from an organisational perspective as well. So that's, a, that's the motivation piece. So what about the characteristics of an individual who may want to steal some data? And this, if we turn to literature, we see a couple of models. The first one being entitled independent model, which is basically someone working by themselves. They've got ac direct access to the information. They're dissatisfied. So this is basically what I think uh, the model that <coughs> Model Hansen had. Um, sometimes you get individuals who, um, for example, engineers, uh, they feel as if they own the information that they're working on, so they feel every right to pick it up and take it to another organisation. You see that an awful lot, and we'll see that in the case study towards the end of the presentation. Uh, and once they feel entitlement, once they're annoyed with the organisation, once they have decided to uh, initiate the compromise, at least the theft and deception. And this can be the really tricky part. So for example, someone hands in their notice, how do you know they haven't been taking stuff before that period? If they hand in their notice and you ask them, are you going to a competitor? No. Well, if they're lying to you, and you don't need to monitor them because you think, oh, he's a good guy, he's not going to go to software company Z and take all of our stuff with them. Uh, that leads to a real issue in terms of understanding that particular piece. The second type identified in the literature is the ambitious leader model. And these individuals are typically um, highly ambitious. Um, they are typically motivated not by internal politics within the organisation, but in order to do something with the data, to create a new company, to go off and start their own firm. And there's one particular example of an individual. She recruited an entire department, effectively, about five or six people. She had a lot of sway over them, got them to steal this information for her. Uh, and she remained with the organisation for two years before she then left to join them in the new company. Quite an interesting piece. So her motivation was basically to get other people to take the rap for her, set up the external code, and then go and join them once they were successful. Quite clever. I'm not saying that I would do that. I was going to do that. It's quite nice. One. So we've got motivations. We've got characteristics of individuals who might steal information. Maybe this will give you some of an idea of some of the things you may need to deploy within your organisation to to stop this from happening. So what about behaviours? What about things you can pick up on, things that you don't have to see to people's heads to understand? Uh, and this is where we get into things like technical and non-technical indicators. And some of these, as I said, some of these are from the literature, some of them you may see them, but they're not entirely indicators that are solid 100% warning signs that someone's about to steal something from your organisation. So, for example, takes material slow. Interesting matters outside the scope of their duties. Unnecessarily copies material. This could be anyone in Zone Fox. This is the, the kind of organisation we we set up. It's, it's really difficult sometimes to pick these out as surefire indicators. Um, then you have um, the technical uh, indicators. So things like disabling, auditing, and logging, copying, deleting the certain files. Um, Anonymizing network activities, which is interesting one because you need admin access in the first place to get into that. These, these are probably slightly uh, more concrete indicators that someone's trying to get around your monitoring systems or your capabilities. Um, yeah, downloading data to external removable drives, that's a tough one because we all need to do that for our day to day existence. Uh, but it, it's, it, it's things that would be out with their normal job profile. So this is where we get to how information is stored. Uh, and, and this is again where you may want to set up some logging capabilities depending on that job role in the organization. So email is a huge indicator. Email removable media. USB drive is a weapon of mass destruction in modern countries because it can store an awful lot of data. Now, what uh, a lot of organizations have found is that some of these are used in combination with each other because the individual really wants to make sure that they've got a copy of the data. So they might email the information out and back it up. Or they might set up a network share 
and they might put it on their laptop as well, just to make sure they've absolutely positively got the information. So maybe you can set up some uh, warning signs around that, some auditing capabilities in order to understand that. For example, if you're worried about file transfer activity, then that's something that can maybe be easily audited. Printed documents, if you're a software company, it would be the first place I would look to try and figure out whether anyone had stolen information. And then you've got the time of day, and this isn't really a useful slide because it's mostly inside and outside working hours. But this is, again, from the literature, mostly people only inside working hours, the majority of it. It's an interesting one. Could be the opportunistic thief, the individual who decides, sort it, I'm going to copy these files, and that's who you could go. So that brings us to our concrete case study. So, this case study is based on some work we did a couple months ago for a globally recognized uh, automotive brand. So, uh, you'll have heard of them. Um, they are well known, they operate on a global scale. Uh, they had, uh, certainly on the site, we were working on a number of departments. So, you had research and development, testing, and you also had client consultancy services as well. And the main, the main thing that they wanted to, to understand was how their consultancy services systems were set up. Because it's interesting, you speak to organisations and they say they don't care about their IP. Usually they're under some sort of contractual obligation to make sure that their customers' IP designs are, are kept safe. And so that's what they were really concerned about. Um, but at the same time, if you speak to an organisation and say, are you worried about your IP? No. Do you leave on the street on a on an encrypted disk? No. It's really interesting to see the, the, the cognitive dissonance going on there. We had engineers. Uh, engineers are very crafty, sneaky people who, in our experience, like to get around security systems. I see you're smiling. Are you an engineer who likes to get around? No. That's what I do. Um, yeah, it's sometimes very difficult to put controls in place because engineers are very clever people who get around things. So it's very much like cat handling. Um, and they deployed Zonefox for basically consultancy reasons to, to understand exactly the state of their system. So it was drawing towards the end of <coughs> the trial, and we, we noticed some interesting behavior. And the, the behavior that triggered it for us was they'd installed backup software. Um, this was in violation of the company's policy. Uh, and they'd done something very clever with it in terms of the, the way they'd set up the software. Basically, they'd set it up as fire and forget. they located a couple of really juicy, interesting places on the network that they wanted to monitor. And whenever a change was made, they would basically just do an incremental backup, so they wouldn't have to copy everything back over the network. They collated it into an easily handleable zip file, just copy and paste it into a piece of uh, um, removable media. And they would run it out of hours as well. So this gave some indication that they kind of knew they were being monitored, kind of knew something was going on. The data itself, they copied 182,000 files. So it was really noisy stuff they were doing. Um, confidential product testing, uh, printed circuit board designs, uh, contracts and agreements with research and manufacturing partners, and CAD designs as well. Um, and there, there's a couple of things in here. I mean, Obviously, as an engineer, you need to have access to source files and source code information. But why do you need access to contracts and agreements? And that's where you, the control piece comes in as well. Maybe that was misconfigured. Maybe that's where someone, some, some, something had slipped. Um, in a lot of cases, we see... Hi. Well, I disagree, because if they're taking that to competitor, the competitor can use that information to try and load more bid, and then they buy the same components from the same suppliers. They already know what a negotiated price a competitor's got. That's the best information. Oh, absolutely, but the engineer should have access to that information in the first place. So um, the, the engineers that, that we work with, they will get access to our contractual information with our customers. And the way we stop them from gaining that access is through access control and separation of privilege. Um, and something had broken down there. And, and you're right, if I was an engineer, I'd see that and be like, yes, fantastic, I'm good to go here. I can absolutely get a fantastic job with that team over there. So, um, typically what we see is, is that kind of stuff where someone is able to gain access to a repository or an archive because, hey, we're all busy, uh, we're all firefighting in our daily jobs, 
You know what sometimes happens? Bob wants to get added to that access group there, so you can do something, but it's a Friday, it's Friday afternoon, and you forget to remove Bob from that particular group. Things snowball from that perspective. Uh, we, we were in an organisation that had um, an, an account set up for, for various uh, admin purposes that they'd forgotten about for a couple of years. Uh, and it was incredibly tricky to, uh, to, to, to track down exactly where it was. So, that's the data. Lots of really interesting stuff. Uh, we put a value around this of about 10 million pounds uh, because of the <coughs> information. And the actual exfiltration itself from the organization uh, went a bit like this. So it happened late at night. They disconnected the endpoints because they had a feeling they were being monitored. It just felt a bit weird and monitored all of a sudden. They plugged in the removable video, copied the files, the zip file, plus some source code from the products onto the removable media. And once they basically unplugged the removable device, they put it back in, uh, basically plugged the machine back in to the network. So we have an individual here who's um, copying files. They know they're being probably being monitored. They're feeling a bit suspicious about it. And so we went to the debrief um, and we reported these results to the CISO. It turned out that he'd handed in his notice for four days beforehand. And he put uh, our monitoring software on his endpoint basically to, to see if he was up to this kind of stuff. And so thinking back to some of the, the original indicators and triggers beforehand, this is where you start thinking about, well, did they lie to the CISO? Did they know they were going to a uh, racing team? Is that why they put that monitoring software on his endpoint? Um, was there something he was doing beforehand? Was this just the tip of the iceberg? Maybe he knew for weeks beforehand, and he'd been doing this for a really long time in order to get a lot of really interesting stuff out of the organization. Now remember, when you lose control of data, it's, it's the stuff you don't know about that can be really scary as well. Um, they had a good insight into this particular archive, so they could do some damage limitations and some control around it. So they could understand if it turned up over there, what had gone on. As the designs that you don't know, you know about the new product designs that you have no idea. Like, that's, that's where some of the issues come from. Um, so what, what have we learned from our particular experiences? It's about five standout things here. Uh, and as you can imagine, they're a mix of process, they're a mix of technical, and a mix of guesswork and voodoo and magic and other things like that. We're in no way in the perfect position to stop insiders, but we can understand some of their motivations and start monitoring or start uh, understanding their particular behaviors on the back of that. Um, this is an obvious one, but the insider threat isn't usually, in fact, it isn't related to hackers. Hackers, external people breaking in, you've got defenses for that. But the person inside your perimeter you may not have any auditing or defenses high. Why if hacker will use inside the trip? Why will they use no, it? No, I'm saying what what if the hacker will use inside the trip? For example, you will be not noticed, but you will be inside. Exactly, and that's the problem because you don't have any systems inside. So you may have put a crunchy shell around your organization to think I'm vulnerable, this is great. But you're not going to be monitoring any of your internal systems because you think, what's the point? And I've seen a lot of organizations who, who do exactly that. So maybe they've got dis uh, uh, defense in depth. And a hacker, you're right, will get an account, they'll elevate the account, become a super user, highest privilege. No, I'm saying simply, we did the same, let's say a couple audits. I lost my shiny gold, silver, uh, wood, USB stick in one of the big software company executive parking. And guess what, within two hours I got access yep. to the VP of sales of big software company. Absolutely. So why use the inside the trade? He doesn't really recognize. But I'm doing something. Are you, are you saying that, that it's a bad approach? Or no, I'm saying, uh, no, no, I'm saying that the insider threat is not related to the hackers. Why is this such a statement? Um, so it, it's, it's a statement that's there to cause controversy on, on purpose. Because it's to do with the mindset of the organization. Because you, if you think your data is just going to be stolen by hackers, you're wrong. Because hackers can pretend to be insiders. You've got employees who are potentially going to steal information for you. So it makes you step back a bit. A bit. Think it's not just about primitive defense, it's about internal defense and everything. It's, it's all that kind of good stuff. 
So where we get the, where we get to with this particular piece is around some solid information security principles. So know your assets. Where's your stuff? Where's your important stuff? Where's your less important stuff? If you lose the spread <coughs> on which the pool's information is written on, that's not as bad as losing your core client sheet, for example. Uh, what stuff do you absolutely need to protect because your, your resource constraint? So things like uh, separation of duty, use privilege, consistency of those policies, all this kind of good stuff. Uh, and also the side of threat awareness into security training. Implement some sort of side of threat uh, awareness course, which we'll get to in a slide from there. Um, a, lot, a few of the messages that um, I've been, uh, been highlighting here around the fact that it's not a technical or security issue, it's a process, it's an organizational thing. So for example, hiring process. Um, in our company we were asked to get background checks for our engineers because of who we work with. Uh, and some companies are starting to get to that point now where people are being checked before they're allowed to work in the organizations. Uh, HR is a great place to understand what's going on with your teams and individuals. Security is a terrible place for that because they don't have visibility on the management process. So a good integrated HR security team is essential for spotting this kind of stuff. Um, negative issues in the work environment. Bob had some stall stuff because he was upset and he wasn't managed properly. There are some people who argue he could probably never be managed properly as part of his psychological makeup. But there are ways in which you can help manage uh, tensions and issues in the workplace. So again, not a cyber security issue by any stretch of the matter. Um, also, make sure that HR tell security when someone's leaving an organization. That's a great way of losing stuff. Um, comprehensive employee termination procedure. Uh, that's exactly it. So make sure that you've got an onboarding process where you know the systems that they're given access to, and you've got termination process where you know which accounts you have to shut down, potentially which assets someone was exposed to as well. And social media is a really interesting one. There's a really interesting company called uh, Digital Shadows, who are based in London, they've been doing some great work with financial services on tracking down IP that may have been leaked on social networks. Uh, you get an awful lot of leakage nowadays in terms of client, key client information. Someone's just done a Facebook profile about this major project that that they're up to, and bang, you've just lost confidentiality with one of your customers. It's a, it's a real issue. Uh, and that's where things like uh, social media policies are really important to, to help, again, guide users in your organization. Um, this is an interesting one, deterrence, not detection. So this is around making sure those processes are in place, making sure that the employee, your team members, that the, they're supported in the day-to-day -day roles, don't feel as if they have to resort to stealing stuff from you. Uh, there's participation and ownership. It's like any good security policy or program. Unless you get buy-in from the top level of the organization, you can have an awful really hard time getting to stick lower down. So it's about communicating and educating your workforce. The other set of lessons around baseline techniques. So make sure you understand what normal looks like in your organization. If someone is backing up files at 2 in the morning, is that something that should be happening? It's something you can implement fairly easily using existing uh, auditing capabilities. Uh, do you normally have engineers emailing out very large CAD files, for example? Again, there are solutions out there that can give you those kinds of insights to what's going on in your organization. Um, SIM, some people don't like uh, SIMs but they can be very useful for linking these particular events together to give you a bit of a context, a bit of a picture, and then you can do a deep dive into the logs themselves. Um, and finally, HR and IT absolutely must do that. And the final piece here is that we're still in our infancy here. Uh, we're still trying to understand why people steal stuff. It's a bit of controversy in literature, there are characteristics, the motivations, these models are interesting. It may not be the absolute reason why. Um, the systems that are in place are still very much broad spectrum approach. So you'll dive straight into the network logs and spend months and weeks trying to figure out what went on when maybe you could speak to someone in HR to understand who'd left recently to give you a more targeted approach. So it's all about context and understanding why you're looking for these things in your organization. 
So we've got some sources here. We've got the FBI inside threat lessons. So the reason why uh, I use that story is because Robert Hansen was a real wake-up call from them. Um, they, they felt fundamentally shocked to their core that solvents were their own still information set to the rival organization. Uh, and they've implemented an awful lot of these recommendations. They're still in a lot of lessons. CERT have a fantastic insider threat block where you've got actual technical stuff you can do, but also process stuff you can look at from an organizational perspective. PwC is always great to have a look at in terms of what goes missing, um, where the next set of prime targets are, and our customers as well. Can I answer any questions? Thanks for listening.